Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you for <clears throat> allowing me to be here and uh, speaking to you, and thank you for those kind words, and uh, uh, do not blame me for the heresies. Please do not. I, <laughs> I have an issue creating enough of my own, let alone Todd's, so... <laughs> And it is great to see some of my former students here. Uh, Andrew leading, the, leading the, the musical worship here. That was fabulous. And uh, I know Andrew and his family, and we've been a long, long, long relationship with, uh, with him and his family. Um, Alicia Whiteside is a student of mine, and I think many of you know who that is. And um, uh, so Alicia's taken a couple of courses. She's taken hermeneutics with me and the Book of Psalms with me. And she, is the, and she takes these courses... Uh, live stream. So there's, she's on screen up here while I'm teaching uh, down, down in uh, Cambridge. And she is the only student I've ever had that has had a parrot attend my classes. <laughs> now, if you know Alicia, uh, I, evidently she has quite a menagerie of birds and other animals. But uh, this parrot uh, regularly attended my classes. Now I understood, understand, learned a few things along the way, so that's good. Um, Todd and Cheryl have been part of my world for many, many years. Uh, both of them students of mine way, way, way back when. When I began teaching in 1978, and I, I forget what year you guys came, but uh, by the way, I started teaching when I was 14, if you're trying to figure out how old I am, right? So uh, yeah, 46 years, 1978, I've been teaching at the school, and what a journey that has been to have that joy of having students come uh, year after year and pay money to listen to me talk. And uh, that's, I got, right now I'm teaching an Old Testament survey class, first year college students. I got 50 college students sitting in front of me every Wednesday afternoon and evening. I get them for four hours. Four to six, seven to nine, I get to teach them through 39 books of the Old Testament. Wow. What a wonderful privilege and joy that. It's exhausting, I have to confess. But uh, what a wonderful joy and privilege to sit with these 17 and 18-year-old students and uh, communicate uh, the truths of God's Word, the Holy Bible, captured in what we know today as the Old Testament. There's a rabbinic saying that says, God made people because he loves stories. God made people because he loves stories. And who does not love a good story well told? A story told to a child at bedtime is often the highlight of the day. Even as adults, we love to hear stories. And perhaps I'm dating myself a little bit, but for years, Stuart McLean, in his Vinyl Cafe, told stories across our country. And thousands of people flocked to hear him tell simple, hilarious, and heartfelt stories of Dave and Morley and the gang. And my wife and I were, one, were among those thousands that came to his shows. And then Sunday after Sunday, I would sit in the car in my driveway while my family was waiting for me for lunch and I was listening to the end of the Vinyl Cafe and I wanted to hear the end of the David, Dave and Morley story. 40% of the Bible is story, Old Testament and New Testament. Here's a question for you. Who wrote more of the New Testament than anyone else. Who has the biggest amount of material, human author, in the New Testament? Okay, so I'll give you three possibilities. Was it Paul? Do I want to take a show of hands here? I didn't do this last time, but how many think it's Paul? Okay, how about John? Okay, a few John. How about Luke? Well, you are the elected remnant of those who said Luke. Luke wrote more of the New Testament than either Paul or John or any other writer in the New Testament. When you count the volume of material between his gospel and the book of Acts, it adds up to more material than what Paul wrote or John. 
And I find the fascinating thing about that is all of Luke's writing is story. The gospel and the story of the church in the book of Acts. God knew the power of story. And I, I call upon the church. It is time for the church and its preachers to get back to reading and expositing stories. But then another side of what I'm interested in talking about and dealing with are the Psalms. The Psalms are the voice of worship for Israel in the first century church. And it is a biblical book that captures an unparalleled and unmatched poetry, the voices of praise and thanksgiving and trust and lament and so much more. And my call again is for the church to return to this book with its voices to restore the full depth and breadth of the worship of God that he has intended ever since he founded his people Israel and now the church. And we are told twice in the New Testament by the Apostle Paul to sing to one another the Psalms along with hymns and spiritual songs. And so in an effort to heed my own words in both both story and song, I have taken 10 psalms that have a story of David attached to them. And that story is talked about in the title of the psalm. So, for example, in Psalm 57, the title reflects on the fact of David and his men trapped in the cave when Saul came in to do his business. In Psalm 22, the title indicates that this psalm is a lament and a confession of sin over his adultery with Bathsheba. In Psalm 3, the title indicates that it is a lament over the death of his son, Absalom. And then Psalm 34 sets the context in the title by saying that it was a time when David faked his insanity when he was caught hiding from Saul in Gath. And so what I've done, I've taken 10 psalms that have these titles that lock it back into a story into 1 and 2 Samuel. And I've rewritten the story. I kind of call it expositional creative writing of the story. And then after I tell the story kind of in my own words, I do an exposition of the psalm in light of the context of that story that has set the the pattern or the backdrop of how that psalm was read and heard. And I call it expositional creative writing in that I have not just read the psalm or read the story from the Samuel text, but in the, in the same way that we don't take, say, if we're preaching a sermon on the book of, of say, Romans 8, we don't just read Romans 8. We read it. But then we work it and we, we, we work with the text. We, we work hard at squeezing out the message that Paul wanted to get across as he wrote that chapter in Romans 8. And so as I rewrite the stories, my task, my goal was to squeeze out the message that the original author had in writing and recounting that story. And in every psalm and story, I ask three questions. And in my view, these three questions are the only questions that the Bible answers. The Bible only answers three questions. The first one, who is God? Second, who are we as the people of God? And third, what is the world? Now, There are dozens of questions under each one of those. But we start with those three foundational questions. God's sacred scripture asks only, who is God? Who are we as a people of God? And what is the world? And the world both as created by God as well as the world that is arrayed against the kingdom of God. So... This morning, uh, your pastor asked me to kick off your series uh, on doing some of these stories and psalms that uh, I've talked about in my little books, uh, This Poor Man Called. 
And the first story that we're going to deal with today does not have a psalm attached to it. It is actually the story of David being anointed by Samuel, and it actually launches the whole story of David that we find in the books of Samuel. And it's the anointing of David after Saul, the first king in Israel, had gotten off the rails with God. And this story starts the whole life of David and is the base for the 10 Psalms that have titles attached to David's life and stories of David's life. So I'm going to read the biblical text to you first, and then I'm going to do what I have called creative expository reading. So the text is 1 Samuel 16. If you've got a Bible or you've got a phone or some kind of uh, device, you can look it up. But I'm going to read the biblical text story to you first, and then I'm going to read a bit more of a creative uh, rendering of this text. Hear the word of the Lord. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul since I have rejected him as king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and be on your way. I am sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I have chosen one of his sons to be king. But Samuel said, how can I go? If, Saul's here, if Saul hears about it, he will kill me. The Lord said, okay. Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice and I will show you what to do. You are to anoint for me the one that I indicate. Now, a little bit of an ethical question going on there, right? Kind of fascinating to see that happen here in this story. Samuel did what the Lord said, and when he arrived at Bethlehem, the elders of the town trembled when they met him, and they asked, do you come in peace? Samuel replied, yes, in peace I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves, come to the sacrifice with me. Then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they arrived, Samuel saw Eliav and thought, aha, surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look on the things that people look at. People look on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and had him pass in front of Samuel. But Samuel said, this, the Lord has not chosen this one either. Jesse then had Samuel, Shammah pass by, but Samuel said, nor has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse had seven of his sons pass before Samuel, but Samuel said to him, the Lord has not chosen these. So he asked Jesse, are these all the sons that you have? Well, there is still the youngest, Jesse answered. He is tending the sheep. Samuel said, send for him. We will not sit down until he arrives. So he sent for him and had him brought in. He was glowing with health and had a fine appearance and handsome features. Then the Lord said, rise and anoint him, for this is the one. Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. And then Samuel went to Ramah. Papa Dave is going to read you a story. I have 14 grandkids, and so I know what it is to read stories. Actually, my wife does it much better than I do. As Jesse stood up from tying what seemed to be his thousandth sheaf, he saw him. Down the road, there was coming a lone man, snowy white hair, flowing beard, leading a calf. In an instant, Jesse knew who this man was. What was the famous, fierce, and dangerous prophet Samuel doing coming to his village, Bethlehem? What had happened? What had they done wrong <laughs> or right? 
Jesse turned and walked briskly to the village. The other elders had already gathered. The news had spread quickly. And Samuel is coming, and he's leading a calf. The silence was ominous as the prophet walked to the village to the central square. He sat on a bench beside the well. Hesitantly and carefully, the elders as a group approached. Yaakov, the head elder, spoke. Shalom, Nebi Samuel. Samuel returned the greeting, Shalom Aleka. And then from Yaakov, do you come in peace? Shalom, yes, in peace I have come, Samuel replied. Lisboa lek Yahweh bati. I have come to offer a sacrifice to the Lord. The prophet went on, prepare yourselves for the ceremony. Quickly, the group dispersed to return to their homes to perform their preparatory rituals, a service of worship for God, to God. The prophet Samuel here personally, this was huge. And as Jesse turned to go, Samuel called quietly, Jesse, come here. Yes, master. I'm coming with you to your house. Yes, master. What was this all about? As the two walked together, Samuel said, gather your sons, for I'm here for another purpose. Uh, yes, master. Uh, why are you really here? I'm here to choose a new king for Judah. The sacrifice is a camouflage in case Saul hears about it. God told me to do it this way. Jesse was dumbfounded. What was going on? He knew that their present king, son, Saul's son of Kish, was not doing well. He had heard that Samuel was pretty ticked at him, but a new king and from one of his sons? Oh, God, what are you doing? And Jesse and his family had gathered at, his, at the house. Samuel performed a little ceremony of consecration, but only Jesse knew the real purpose of all this. Back to the village center they went. An altar had been built and was burning, and the sacrificial calf stood quietly tied to a tree. In front of the villagers, elders, and family of Jesse, Samley quickly and deftly slaughtered the calf, skinned it, and laid the carcass on the flames. The blood was carefully poured out and sprinkled on, the, on and around the altar. The smell of burning flesh and smoke filled the air. Then Samuel gave Jesse the nod, and Jesse quickly whispered to his oldest son, Eliav, Go stand in front of Samuel. <laughs> Somewhat confused, Eliav stood in front of the frightening prophet. Eliav was tall, handsome, strong, a born leader, the firstborn child. This one's a lock, Jesse thought. Samuel looked him over. He thought to himself, oh yeah, this is the one. He bowed his head, but when he looked up, he shook his head slowly and then turned to Jesse. No, not this one. Please bring another son. Jesse was dumbfounded. What do you mean not the one? He is the first. He is the head son. In a daze, Jesse touched the, the arm of Abinadab, his second son. He, turned, uh, he took his turn in front of Samuel. And again, the seeming sense of satisfaction. The head bowed in prayer and then the shake of the head. Rejection number two. Jesse, another son, please. This time it was Shama who stood before Samuel. The same ritual, another rejection for all seven sons. The process and conclusion was the same. All good, healthy, intelligent men, all rejected. Jesse was mortified. What was Samuel after? And Samuel was speaking to him and he seemed confused. Jesse, do you have any more sons? Well, Master, yes, I do. I have a katon, a little one, their baby brother. Parenthesis, the eighth of seven sons. <laughs> we get it. In parenthesis, he's out in the pasture looking after the sheep. Surely not David, Jesse thought. He's just a kid. This is not the way we work. We're after our king here. We need the biggest, the best, the one with charisma. That had been their choice in Saul. Oh, sure, he had gotten off the rails with God, but this was what the other nations around them all had. We need a king like the other nations. How could they hold their own with the Philistines and the Canaanites without this kind of king? David? A child? The little one? An oops? 
The prophet's voice penetrated his reverie. Go get him. We will not sit down until he comes. And Jesse called over a young boy and whispered, go find David and, and you stay and look after the sheep. And the boy ran off and they waited. And finally David came and stood before Samuel. Yes, a youth, but good looking and strong. And again, the survey with the eyes and the head bowed in prayer. But this time when Samuel looked up, he put his hand on David's shoulder. The boy sank to his knees. And from the folds of his cloak, Samuel took out a ram's horn of olive oil. And in front of the wide-eyed circle of people gathered there, including a father, mother, elders, and seven rejected sons, he poured the oil over David's head and shoulders and quietly announced, Behold the king of Judah. Everyone is thunderstruck. So that's what this was, a coronation, an anointing as a king. And can you believe it? Eliab and the others were all rejected. Further, King Saul, our choice, rejected. And now this, David, you got to be kidding, anointed king? And Samuel picked up his things to leave, and Jesse touched his arm and pulled him aside. What just happened here? Why David? Why not Eliab, Abinadab, Shammah, or the others? And Samuel said, this is what God said to me. I do not look on the things that people normally look at, appearance and height. People look on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. And with that, Samuel disappeared back up the road he had come. Okay, that was my hand at creative storytelling, and no, I am not Stuart McLean. And I remember I did this uh, similar kind of story in another church, and I made that comment, and a guy came up to me afterwards and says, yep, for sure, you're not Stuart McLean. <laughs> Thank you very much. So as I said earlier, the Bible answers basically three questions that are crucial to how we see and live out our faith with Jesus Christ. Who is God? Who are we as the people of God? And what is the world? And what are we learning about the world? And it is in answering these three questions that we find impact and application. So let's try and answer these questions from this story. So the first question is, what are we learning about God? And another way of asking this is, what is our encounter with God? And three things emerge, emerge for me in understanding who God is and what we're learning about God in our encounter with God in this story. And the first one is this. God loves to choose the marginalized, the little one, the katone, the oops, the leftover. Listen to the Apostle Paul. Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. He chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. He chose the lowly things of the world and the despised things, the things that are not, to nullify the things that are so that no one can boast before him. And this is the foundational nature of Christ's kingdom. This is how God works. And this was Jesus when James and John wanted the power positions in the kingdom of God. And Jesus confronted their sinful desire for power, position, and prominence with, this is how the Gentiles think, not so with you. If you want to be first, you've got to be last. If you want to be master, you must be servant. God loves to use the ordinary, the common, the catones of this world. Second thing that we learn in, in what, are we, what are we learning about God, the second thing we see is God will choose to reject the powerful when they take on their own power. Power is good when it's used in the right way. But Saul took power to himself, and that led him down the path of destruction to the point where God took the empowering Holy Spirit from him, took it off him, and placed on Saul an empowering evil spirit. This is a huge warning to any and all of us who have power over others, whether in church, the family, a marriage, the community, the workplace, or wherever. 
And then third, as we learn about God, we learn that God loves to break the patterns of normative thinking. The norm was for the eldest male in the family to be the one that was prominent. He was the priest of the family and had the birthright. But David was chosen over seven older brothers. And no wonder Jesse was confused. But throughout the Old Testament and even into the New, God breaks the normative pattern of expected status and power. The choice of Ehud, described in the Bible as left-handed. The Hebrew text reads, weak in his right hand. So just in case you're left-handed, you just need to know biblically you're defective. (laughs) Well, that was a figure of speech back then. But no, the whole point was... If you're left-handed, you're weak in your right hand. Interesting, then God uses that, Ehud. The choice of Jephthah, of all people, the son of a prostitute, to redeem and, and, uh, and protect his people. Even the choice of Deborah and Yael, women, over Barak. Then Gideon, the self-declared weakest and least, And then, faithless, faithless, as he tested God with his fleeces. And we could go on. And so we have this beautiful encounter with God. One that gives us all hope. Then the second question. So, first one, what are we learning about God? The second one, what are we learning about ourselves as the people of God? Well, I find in this story that there's really good news here. And the good news is we all have a chance. We all have a place. We all have something to contribute. And not many of us, in fact, I would argue none of us, are outside the domain of Katon. And good leaders inevitably come from humble origins and who never forget those origins. I'm a kid off a farm from Woodbridge. That's my family and that's my backdrop. I grew up milking cows and driving tractors. Humble origins. My dad was a humble farmer, loved the Lord. You would never know anything about him other than his just a humble, humble man and he raised us to be the same kind of people. But there's one central idea that this story emphasized about who we need to be as the people of God, and it is that word, heart. And Samuel said, this is what God said to me. I do not look on the things that people normally look at, appearance and height. People look on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. We are so vulnerable to the externals, the resume, the CV, the personality, the appearance, the presence, the wealth, the status, the reputation, the name recognition. Saul was the people's choice. He had all the externals, size, appearance, someone that people could take pride in when leading his people into battle. And by the way, this does not say that we don't look for competence. This is not to say that characteristics of leadership and ability to do the task are not important. But character, the heart, is at the foundation of any choice. And we often say that when we look for a leader or look for someone to do a task, we look for three things. We look for competence, we look for chemistry, and we look for character. And the last of those three, in my mind, stand as the deal breaker. So what are we learning about ourselves as God's people? One, churches are made up of very ordinary people. God loves to build his church with people like you and me, and it gives us great confidence as each of us serve God and each other. It also tempers our expectations of others. We're all katones in the work of God, and it's called grace. Second thing that we're learning here is that heart, character, must stand at the very foundation of who we are and who we look to for leadership. And now third, what do we learn about the world? It's pretty obvious, isn't it? The foil to the whole story is King Saul, the people's choice. We want a king like the other nations. 
And in doing so, God said, they have rejected me as king. You know, it's interesting. In the church, the metaphor for leadership is shepherd. In a meeting I attended one time, the speaker, who in fact was kind of a power player pastor, told us endlessly about all that he is doing for God in the church. And then he said, shepherd? Yeah, I guess that's okay. But what we need are more ranchers. Huh. A pastor of a larger church, or a church, a fairly large church in the area, a gentle kind of guy and rather quiet and humble, kind of grumbled and muttered out loud for all of us to hear. I don't see any references to ranchers in the Bible. <laughs> yeah, perhaps we bit of us have a bit of a soft picture of shepherd, but the metaphor is there. And let's face it, and this is a hard turn. I realize I'm making a hard turn at this point. But what is the central symbol of our faith? Yes, we have the throne. We get there. Yes, we have a crown, we get there. But how does it all start? It starts with a cradle and a cross. A cross. Paul, listen, the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those of us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For since in the wisdom of God, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached, namely the cross, to save those who believe. The Jews demand miraculous signs. The Greeks look for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, the power of God and the wisdom of God. It is in the foolishness and the weakness and the poverty of the cross that God brings redemption and forgiveness to anyone who would believe. And this is huge. It goes against all the normative patterns that we follow. Normative patterns like power and strength are better than weakness. Winning is better than losing. Big is better than small. Health is better than sickness. Comfortable living is better than suffering. Gain is better than sacrifice and loss. And yes, each of those couplets need to be nuanced. I get it. But listen to me carefully. The message that we proclaim, the message of the gospel, is based in a complete reversal of the normal pattern of power and conquest. The cross of Jesus Christ, the symbol of death, shame, weakness, and suffering, stands at the heart of our faith. It stands at the heart of our ministries. It stands at the heart of our jobs, both in here and out there. It stands at the heart of any leadership role that we might have, and it stands at the heart of any and all relationships we have. And so, some questions to challenge us. Are some of us holding back from ministry for God because we think we are too ordinary, too small, too much of a katone? Are we caught in the trap of looking for, prof for the professional and the expert to somehow be, the, be like the other nations? However, I do remind us that lack of competence is not a virtue. In our grumbling over how things are done, is it because of a bunch of very ordinary people who are working very hard to do their best, yet maybe in our grumbling, it's not quite good enough for us? Have we become weak and broken before God so that we might be powerful with God through the shame and the foolishness and weakness of the cross? Are we living the faith as servants who suffer and sacrifice for God and his people? How's our hearts? What does God see there when he looks at yours and mine as we serve him and serve each other? And are we willing and able to look beyond the externals? Perhaps look at others who are not like us and see their hearts. Then a final word of encouragement, and this is the, a paragraph that I wrote at the end of this chapter in my little book. It is good news that God is a God who works through the ordinary, who in grace reversed the power structure and chose a cross and who knows our hearts. Why? Because it gives us all a chance. And we think about who and what we are as the people of God in the world. We see God's choice of the katone, the ordinary 
perhaps even the odd and the left out. We see God's rejection of the self-sufficient, and we see the centrality of the spirit of the cross, even in the contrast of David and Saul. Finally, we see the core of heart, a heart totally given to God. Let's pray. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, we hear this story perhaps through new ears and a new mind. We hear that repeated echo, the repeated echo of we want a king like the other nations and how that took them so far from God. We hear the echo of we so often look on the external, but God looks on the heart. And I pray, Heavenly Father, that some of these truths would penetrate deeply into our lives because we want to please you and love you and worship you with our hearts. In Christ's name we pray.